feel free to raise your hand, ask questions at any point, kind of as we go through this, because um, there's a lot of different things I'm involved with, some that make sense to me and don't make sense to a lot of other people, which is one of the things that I think is why my job changes every day, because people don't always understand what we do. Um, by title here at Whitewater, I this, tomorrow is my three-month anniversary, I started September 1st. Um, I'm the Assistant Athletic Director for Development, so essentially I ask rich people for money. Um, it's kind of a cool job, you get to meet a lot of cool people, um, but you're also asking people for money all day, every day. Um, my background, so I'm from the East Coast, this is my like 90th day in the Central Time Zone. I grew up in Delaware, I went to the University of Maryland, graduated from there in 2011. My first boss out of college just got fired about a month ago. Uh, he was the head football coach of the Maryland football program where I was his assistant director of football operations. Um, so in that role, as a 21, 22 year old, he asked me to graduate early, so I finished the semester early and started with him. Um, I was in charge of a $2 million operating budget for our team. Anything that involved our student athletes, I had my hand in, um, in some form or fashion. So from there, I, I did that for three years, was tired of the 3 a.m. phone calls from our, our players when they're down at the police station or whatever they were doing at uh, 3 in the morning. Um, from there, it was time for me to get out of that world. Um, I had a couple opportunities, entry-level jobs in the NFL, kind of getting into scouting or whatnot. But I wanted to, to stay in Maryland at, at that point and get more involved in the outreach side of things. So I went into an academic development position. So what that means is um, I was a part of, I guess the equivalent here would be the College of Letters and Sciences or the College of Business and Economics. And I was working with alumni on philanthropic gifts there. So I did that for a year and a half. And it was time for me to get back into athletics. This opportunity came up, so now I'm here. Um, so what we do here is we, at the Division Three level, it's a little different than Division I. Um, we don't have scholarship um, scholarship players in any capacity. So at Maryland, all the development-related fundra fundraising initiatives were geared towards raising money for scholarship. Um, every now and again, you'd have capital projects to, to help with facilities and so forth. Um, here, it's a different type of setup because of how our operating budgets work and um, certainly with the facilities we have at Whitewater versus our peer institutions. So we have to fundraise, our coaches have, coaches have to fundraise about 50% of their operating budget. Um, so if you think about women's basketball or, or any program, let's say their operating budget to get through a year is $60,000. From student fees, they might only get $30,000 uh, for a given year. So in order them, for them to operate, meaning budgets or buses for travel and Gatorade after, during games and all that, they've got to, they're out of necessity, raise another $30,000. Um, so that's what my job is to help coordinate with them to solidify a, sustain, a sustainable budget related to that type of stuff, while also looking at the bigger picture, whether it's facility enhancements and raising money um, for that. So we just got approved to do a, a new um, baseball clubhouse, expanded by, I think, 2,000 square foot feet or something like that. The state gave us, through student fees, approval to, I think, 30% of the money will come from the students, from student fees, from what you guys do. So that means that for, in order for us to put the building up, we've got to fundraise another 70%. So now we're competing against our operating budget, um, which is goes back to what Joe said when he first introduced me. Looking at how my job changes every day, understanding the priorities of how we bring in external revenue. Um, so I guess to, to really dive into what we're doing, and um, I know you guys heard from who, Leah? Bob Lanz at all? Christina, Bob, Leah, yeah. Carrie. So how I fit with all of them in terms of the money that comes in and how it's used. My money, the money we have is not necessarily restricted. Um, so Bob, he's our budget guy, so he looks at the budget, looks at how much we get from the state or through student fees, and then our money, then I, I kind of have to help with the coaches fill that void. Now, as it relates to everybody else on the team, so Chris, Leah, that whole crew, um, I work with almost exclusively with our alumni, with our former student athletes, with the local community in terms of supporters. Um, so it's a truly a philanthropic mindset. So for anybody who might have an athletic interest, if you're a fan of baseball because you're wearing a Brewer shirt, so in 
17 years when you're graduated and you're married and have a job and, and you're living a good life, I'm going to come to you and ask you to give $1,000 to the baseball program every year. Um, so what we're trying to build now is build the case statement for why we need that support. Um, my position's only existed for three years. Uh, my two predecessors both lasted about a year, um, and then they wanted they were held down on getting to Division One, and, and both have jobs at the Division One level. By definition, the term development, you have to develop. That takes time. So hopefully, I'm still here in 17 years when you're making the money you're making, so that we can over from now until you graduate until you you are five years out, ten years out, have your third job, and you're make a solid living, we've developed that relationship long enough that in 17 years when I go ask you for that thousand bucks a year, or at that point it might be 50,000 bucks a year, that you might say no, but you're not going to say go screw yourself. We're still going to be able to send holiday cards to each other and all that. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know, my, my job sucks, I guess, when it comes down to. I don't know. What, what do you guys want to know? Ask questions. Yeah, go. Um, I work at Phone Plan, so I help raise nice. money. Nice. Okay. So, how um, much of that money come? I know it's not very much, but you know, like how much that we raise goes to you guys. So, Phonathon here at Whitewater, the first. So, does everyone know what the Phonathon does? Is anything like that? Okay. So, there's a group of students that have a manager, um, who they essentially go in there every night, and there's this. Called Ruffalo Cody. There's so there's this um, program that it's a telemarketing situation. So there's these ten students or however many it is. They get on there. They start calling up our alumni. Um, automatically generates who they call. So you answer and you say hi, and the student says, "Okay, my name's Kirby. I'm calling from UW Whitewater. Want to know about your alumni experience?" Well, no, they really don't want to know about your alumni experience. They they want to get twenty five dollars from you. So the first ask is always for the general annual fund for the institution, um, which, so that's just, we, there are different thoughts on how that process works. So this is the first direction for getting <coughs> alumni to give back. So the idea is that every time they call, an alum will give 25 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever it may be. So then me, in terms of going out and visiting with alumni face to face, It'll make more sense, okay, I'm going to look at their profile and realize, okay, they have some type of affinity. Then I'm going to look at wealth screenings because I'm a professional stalker and look at what their house looks like, estimated value of their home, see how much money they might have there. And then I'm going to know, based on the fact that they've given $100 annually to some random student that's been calling them, that if I can go get, up, get a coffee with them, get lunch with them, whatever, that I can probably ask them for 1000 um, bucks a year and then do that for three or four years, and then it becomes 5,000 a year, then it becomes 10,000 a year. So the, the telethon, the, the phonathon in, in our setup and development is the entry gateway towards making donations back to the institution. Um, so as it pertains to this institution with athletics money, we get support as a department from the chancellor's office through the annual loyalty fund. Um, but I think athletics is the third ask, I think, unless a donor suggests it. So, we don't see a lot of money from the phonathon, but it is a good gateway to see alumni who have given, and then that's going to make more sense for me of who I go visit or, or whatnot. So I'll give you an example of how we determine who we call and, and go that route. So this weekend we're playing Oshkosh. Um, go ahead. Well, I, I just have a separate question from that. You can okay. Let me finish. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So we're playing Oshkosh, up at Oshkosh. Friday night we're going to go up, the Chancellor wants to do a dinner with some um, decent capacity, high affinity alumni. So what that means is it doesn't have to be the highest of capacity, so it doesn't have to be our multimillionaires, but she wants it to be people who are capable of making six-figure gifts at some point, whether it's now or in estate planning at some point. So that's decent, decent um, level capacity. She wants high affinity, meaning people that have an affinity to give back to this place. So what I'm now tasked with is finding four or five couples in the Oshkosh area to invite to dinner who might accept an invitation to have dinner with the chancellor. Um, so I'll look at those types of things, look at people who have given every year for the last five years and to see where they've given, because obviously if, with my involvement, I wanted to have some type of an athletics influence because we want to sway their money to come to athletics. Um, and then I'll, I'll look at wealth screenings based off of um, public salary and, and past giving and um, retail property or 
property sales tax and all that crazy stuff and um, find people that, that have capacity that are capable of making a, a six-figure gift. Uh, so what happens if a team doesn't make their portion of what they need? You go into debt. So are there teams in debt right now? Like, is there? No, so it's an interesting situation, and that's the difference in mindset for me coming from a more sophisticated program coming from the University of Maryland where operating budgets come from the state, um, so you're kind of fully sufficient there, where we fundraise out of necessity. So just like your own bank account, you can only spend the money after you, you exhaust your, your student fee money, your state money, the, the money that you get at the beginning of the fiscal year, you can only spend the money that's in your bank account. Um, so I'll take it a step back. So I work, I'm a dual reporter. I report to Amy Edmonds, the athletic director, and I report to John Enslin, the vice chancellor of university advancement. Um, so John is also the president of the foundation, the University of Wisconsin Whitewater Foundation. What that means is that the university kind of has their own bank account, bank setup. So when you look at how we invest money for endowments and all that stuff, John's in charge of that. So any money that we fundraise from outside sources goes into this bank account. That might be specific for the men's basketball program. So now Pat Miller looks at that bank statement at the beginning of every month or the 15th of every month, whenever he does, and he knows he can only spend what's in that, that bank statement. Just like your own bank accounts, your checking accounts, if you withdraw too much from there, there's some type of penalty associated with it. And then at some point you have to pay that. Does that make sense? Yeah, so do they, like, for the football team to keep advancing, do they have to keep doing more fundraisers so they can go farther and farther? Or like, yeah, do yes they have a no. debt that they um, pay back afterwards? Yes and no. The, how we're set up, we're very fortunate at Whitewater. It's one of the reasons we've had so much success over the last decade. We've had great chancellor support. So the chancellor's office, which does go back to the annual loyalty fund from the telethon, the chancellor has discretionary funding where she can allocate it wherever she sees fit in the institution. We've been fortunate enough that our chancellors have been very supportive of postseason play. So they'll help cover some of those overages. And for postseason play, there's also, um, the NCA gives us some money. Um, so there's some, there's per diem related to that. Um, so there, it, it's not a direct correlation, and that's one of my missions in, in looking at the concept of philanthropy, is to get out of this habit of fundraising out of necessity, so that we can fundraise and, and do what philanthropy is truly intended to do, which is make gifts that can change people's lives, take it to the next level, and not do it because we have to. Yep. Do you ever miss being at a bigger school, being back at? It's different. Um, there, there's a lot of opportunity here in terms of um, growing into that because the, the foundation's here. Um, when I was kind of exploring and, and wasn't really actively looking, I, I know I wanted to get back into athletics, I wasn't going to come to any Division Three institution. Um, Division Three hadn't even really crossed my mind until this opportunity came up. So when I came out and interviewed, I didn't know what to expect. When I got here, saw all the facilities, not necessarily in the Williams Center because we do need improvements. We need another gym that's more of an arena gym. We, we need more here. But when you go out to baseball, softball, I mean, some of those facilities out there are better than the schools that, that I, uh, better than at Maryland and some of the schools in the ACC and the Big Ten that I traveled to. So, okay, next step of this is looking at our metrics and how I'm judged. So the cool thing about coaching, uh, I guess cool, is that you're judged on wins and losses, right? You're judged on if you win games or if you, you don't win games. Um, the cool thing about my job is I'm judged the same way. I'm judged on how much money I bring in. If I don't bring in money, then I get fired. Um, so it's very cut and dry on if I'm performing or if I'm not performing. So this first chart, so I'll go through some of the, the charts that in my head I think are important in terms of, of metrics. Um, first chart is total fundraise dollars. So what you see there is the orange line is where we are fiscal year to date. So fiscal year starts July 1. Um, all the other lines are that top blue line is a 20% increase from fiscal year 15. So generally when I do my own goal setting, I'll take it back a step. Because of how new my position is, um, and the two previous people in my position, this was their first job, um, there, what, there's not a strong 
hard line goal of what money I have to raise. So what I did for my goal setting was I based it off the prior fiscal year, added 20% to it. Um, so that's what that FY16 goal is. So where we're at, we're already double where we were in total money into the foundation, into any athletics foundation account than we were at the end of last year. Um, so if I wanted, I could sit there and not do any more work the rest of the way. And my bosses could not make an argument that, that I'm not doing my job because I've already fundraised double what they did all of last year and all the year before and so on and so forth. Um, so while I still want to support athletics and we have a lot of needs because we fundraise out of necessity, um, I'm not going to do that. But really, in my mind right now, I'm already planning for the next fiscal year. Because when, when things get reported, I want my numbers next year to look just as good. Now, this is a little skewed because I was fortunate enough my kind of month into the job, we secured uh, one of the biggest gifts in the athletics department history. Um, did I have anything to do with that? Probably not. Was I the development officer that helped execute the paperwork? Absolutely. So is that going on my resume? Absolutely. Um, so that is why that number looks so high. Now, you go back to, okay, how does this impact the rest of our sports programs, right? Which is what we have to figure out. Well, that's not an unrestricted gift. That gift is going towards a specific project. So IRS regulations say, if you say you want your money going to something, it has to go to it. So if a donor came in and said he wanted to give $20 million to, name, to create a leprechaun study program, that $20 million has to go to that, or the institution doesn't have to accept the donation. Um, so in this case, the donor wanted the money to go to a specific project. So we can't, so we then have to be creative with how do we benefit the other 19 sports programs to kind of take advantage of, of that um, seven figure gift. So that's the, that's the end all be all metric is how much money you bring in. This metric here is total gifts in. Um, so this means if I make a gift today and tomorrow, that counts as two, right? If, so the, the next one, just to give you an idea of the difference there, with total donors, if I make a gift today and tomorrow, it counts as one. Um, so what this shows, the, again, the top line there is 20% increase from the year before. But what it shows here, this orange line from FY16, where we are here, is I've got a long way to go in terms of month to month to get to where we were just last year, let alone to get to that 20% increase. Now you could attribute that to the fact that I spent time on a seven figure gift, which is again our ultimate metric to, to bring money in. Um, but it, this, doesn't, this chart doesn't necessarily help my argument that I know what I'm doing. Nor does this one, the, the total donor uh, chart. So, Last year we had 986 donors, which is that gray line, the second one on the right, second from the top. Um, we're tracking now, I, I feel confident that we can get to 1,000, which is going to be my internal goal. I'm not even going to show people the 20% increase. Um, but again, from where we were this time last year, when I wasn't here, I'm below by, what, 50 donors, something like that. Um, so that's where 50 is not a big number when you have a school that has 190,000 alumni, but we want to make sure that we are counting numbers because you, you want to see every, every donor counts in something like this. Um, the argument, so after, when they see this, I look like I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. When they see this, these two, I'm not. I suck at my job. So my argument to then support two and three is this chart, which shows the average size, the average amount of a gift, both of these are different, versus per gift or per donor versus the other years. So in FY16, you can see that the average size per gift, the amount of time I'm spending for an individual gift or an individual donor is going to yield a lot more dividends. Obviously, it's a major outlier with that seven-figure gift, but again, it shows that we are trending the right way. Um, what I now have to do in order to, to keep trending and really looking at next year, because you can't ever bank on a seven-figure gift just kind of planning your lap, is how are we going to be able to sustain this same level of growth so that it doesn't look like an outlier, um, so that it does look in some capacity like I know what I'm doing. 
So that is what I'll spend the next six months while continuing to raise money, also preparing to justify that I'm good at my job for the following fiscal year, knowing there might not be a seven-figure gift just sitting in my lap. Questions, comments, concerns? So, like, the money that you're raising now is for next year? No, the money we raise now is still for this year. Um, so that's, again, we're trying to make sure set, figure out what my job is and, and what I'm supposed to say and not say. At a more sophisticated program, the money that is raised in a fiscal year, whether it's through, we'll say fundraised dollars, but certainly in ticket revenue and, and other external revenue sources, will generally go into a pot, then being divvied up the following fiscal year by whoever's in charge, generally the athletic director. Because we fundraise out of necessity, because we only get 50% of our operating budget covered, all the revenue that comes in is for the current year. Um, so what we need to do is build a stronger discipline so that, we'll go back to the men's basketball example, if they've got to get $60,000 in in a given year, and the students, the state gives 30,000, so we have to raise another 30,000. What happens if we raise 35,000, right? So now we have a, a surplus of 5,000. What is our discipline? What are, are we putting that into reserves? Are we putting that towards an endowment? What are we doing with that? Um, and that's kind of the culture that we've got to change. And the cool thing, going back to the, the do you like being at this size school versus the division one? We are at the cutting edge. No other Division three school is thinking about this. I don't think there's another Division three school, there's not another school in our conference that has my position um, where it's exclusively development. Um, so that's exciting and, and it makes it very hard because we can't compare against our peers. Uh, I was down at Wheaton on Saturday and that's a great religious school and, and they do a good job. But our facilities are 10 times better than theirs. Um, so we can't, even compared to, to what they're doing as a private. Um, but then you also have the argument, well, we can't compare it to a Division One because we're not a Division One. So we, every day, are fighting to identify what our realistic goals can be um, and, and then figure out how to keep making ourselves better with that. And the, the budget is one of the big things to make it a more sophisticated operation. So it's not money coming in, money coming out. So Because if you have it down here, you got to be able to draw on something. Um, so you said there's like 900 and some gifts. Like, who else helps raise that money? Like the coaches. Oh, okay. yeah. So we're different than Division One. Coaches at Division One level hate fundraising because they don't have to do it. When it's a necessity here, the coaches are are very much involved because otherwise they they don't survive. Um, so my role with with our coaches. They've obviously done it and done it well, well before I got here. Um, so my job is to help enhance what they're doing, not to change what they're doing. So while that, that's kind of the short term plan while working with the sport programs. Then on the other side, I'm also starting to generate new revenue. Hopefully what that new revenue will do is we put it in, in some type of reserve, whether it's endowment or, or whatnot. And that new revenue will eventually in three, five, ten years, we can go to the coaches and say, look, you guys don't have to fundraise anymore because we have you covered. Um, we, we have the money in place that you guys can just concentrate on coaching because that's what we want as an athletic administration team is we want our coaches to concentrate on coaching because winning is not the only reason we're here because we're developing great student athletes, but this is a business and it's about winning. Um, so if we can alleviate if I can help enhance their fundraising efforts so they can raise more money so they don't have to spend more time on fundraising, then that helps us. Good. Questions? Did I miss anything? Yeah. So if, say, you and Pat Miller sat down with a former alumni yeah. and they happened to, they were played for Pat Miller or something, and they made a donation, would that money go to athletics or would it go to Pat for yeah, the basketball so let's team? Use, we'll use a real life example. Let's use Generac. Everybody knows Generac over on the east side of town. Um, so their CEO is a former track and field student athlete. He's also a former uh, business school um, student. 
Aaron Yagabell. So Aaron, as we engage in conversations with him, so this will really get into it. So Aaron's a science solicitor. So I have six colleagues on the academic side of campus that are under my dual report under John Enslin. So Emily Greenwald, she raises money in the same way I do for the College of Business and Economics. So she is assigned, she is the primary relationship manager for Aaron. Well, Aaron's also a, a former student athlete, so I'm the secondary contact for Aaron. So for us to put a plan in place, I can't just call Aaron and say, hey, do you want to go have lunch and, and talk? I've got to go through Emily because she's the primary relationship manager. So let's say Emily and I both go and, and have lunch with him, and the dean, Dean Chenoweth goes, the, the dean of um, College of Business, and Mike Johnson, our track and field coach, they also join us. So we sit down and Aaron says, look, I, I want to make a $100,000 gift. Um, and this didn't happen yet, but this could happen hopefully next month, um, where he says, I want, I want to do $100,000. You guys give me a proposal and tell me, give me some options. So now we know what the number is. We, we've fortunately solved our, our first issue, which is how much can we actually ask for. So we'll go, we'll leave the lunch and say, okay, Emily and, and probably me as the, the development officers will go back to him um, probably before the end of the calendar year because it might be, he might want to get the money in from a tax standpoint. So we'd schedule lunch while we're sitting there for three weeks out. Um, and we'd come back here and we'd start putting a proposal together. That proposal will include two amounts. It'll include the 100000 that he said he was going to do. It'll also include 250000 because why not shoot high if, if you already No, The worst you can say is no. In that 100000 or $250,000, we'll also give him ideas of how he can split it up. Um, so it might be, okay, we want, you should give $50,000 to the track and field program and $50,000 to the college of business. Or maybe because we know his interest, you might have interest in athletics generally, 25 to track and field, 25 to the athletics discretionary fund for the athletic director to use as she pleases. And then maybe it's 25 to college of business and 25 to um, the general annual loyalty fund for the chancellor to do what she wants to do with it. Um, so my job in that theory is to take our, the university's needs, our priorities, our goals, and try and match them with the donor's intent. Um, so I've got a, I, I represent the donor and I represent the, the institution. So it's hopefully giving the donor opportunity so his gift is, a, is as impactful as he wants it to be. Um, so in, in the case of Pat Miller, if that person says, we go to lunch, Pat and I, and the guy says, hey, I want to give 10000 to men's basketball, then I can't, per IRS, I cannot move that money. That money is going to men's basketball. Now, can there not be a conversation behind the scenes with, with Pat and say, hey, we just got you $10,000 that we thought was coming here, or, or we just got you new money in $10,000. Will you give $2,500 from X account and put it back towards the athletic general budget or, or whatever that may be? Um, so that's one of the things that you, you've got to give the donor opportunity to, to select what he or she wants to do, but then on the back end, you have to be able to have those open and honest conversations about how gifts are really going to impact what your goals are. And the seven-figure gift going towards that specific project is a prime example of that. Um, we're trying to figure out now how can that impact the other 19 sport programs um, in a positive way, because otherwise it impacts one, but that might only be, we have 700 student athletes, that sport program might have 50. There's still 650 student athletes that aren't benefiting from one of the biggest gifts in athletic department. Anything else? Last chance. Yep. So Adam, you did like a uh, high net worth alumni, but they didn't really like that. So do you guys like to keep like plane trips or yep. car, car trips and things like that? So I'll uh, give you a real life example. Eric Baldwin, um, who is a poker player, former baseball player here, um, won it big, I don't know, three years ago, four years ago. Um, he made a, a substantial commitment to um, John Bowen Lynch, our baseball coach, to help with the lights on the baseball field. So he just, so nobody ever went out to see him. He has family still here in Wisconsin, so Bo would go see him um, while he was he was local, um, talk about the gift, they talked on the phone and all that. So he just finished his final pledge payment on that gift. Um, so pledge payments are usually five-year commitments where he'd say, 
I want to do a million dollars over five years. Okay, you do two hundred thousand a year. You can uh, invoice or pledge reminder at the beginning of every every year to, to make that payment. So he just finished his final pledge payment. So Vo comes to me and says, "Look, I think there's more money there. Um, I, I think we we need to go out there. I don't think we need to solicit if we can see him, but I think we need to get out there and, and thank him." Well, for the size of the gift that he did without anybody seeing him, I can then take that to John Enslin, who my dual report, and say, look, can you, can you pay for Bo and I to go um, take a trip to Vegas, where he lives? Um, and I've already done the plane prices. It was 120 bucks round trip um, for each of us, so nothing crazy. So John said, yeah, if you can use that as your anchor visit, that's your big visit, and, and go out and steward that gift, and then find two, or three, four other people to meet with, then, then uh, it's worth the trip. Um, so December 14th, we're flying out to Vegas. We'll be there the 14th, 15th, and 16th. We're planning on meeting with Eric, and, and so that'll be purely stewardship. That'll be us taking him to, to dinner and just saying thank you and just hanging out with him. Um, we're gonna see a guy by the name of Tom Leahy, who's given the athletic department $50,000 each of the last two years. Never been visited before. He's just been in his IRA. He's been making an end of year gift of 50k a year. So we'll go see him. Hopefully, he'll be handing us a check for 50k, kind of that annual payment that he's been doing every year. Um, we're going to go see a relative of one of our staff members who is a multimillionaire. Um, and now I'm in the process. This morning, I started looking at wealth screenings of all the UW Whitewater alumni living in Vegas, and just going down the list and saying, "Hey, would you guys like to?" Go get coffee or grab a bite to eat with Mo and I. Uh, kind of introducing myself and saying, "Here's what I do. Here's my role." Um, they know by the title that I'm a fundraiser, that my job is to ask them for money. But the pitch is that we're trying to engage them with their own water. Um, my job, and it's one of the interesting ethical questions when you get into fundraising and development, is how friendly can you get with somebody? You can get friendly, you can't be friends with them. So my job is develop relationships that inspire philanthropy. So everything I do has to be with that mindset that I'm eventually going to ask that person for money. Because um, as soon as you, you cross that, as soon as you you mitigate that concept, then it's a lot harder to ask somebody for money because now you're asking a friend for money. You're, it's not a business relationship. Um, and that's one of probably the hardest things about this job, and for me, I literally moved halfway across the country and knew nobody when I got here. Um, I'm always working, because I don't have friends or family in this area, so not necessarily always working in the office, which I do that, um, but anytime I'm out, I'm always thinking, how can this help us raise money for this athletic department or this institution? Do you guys have any donors who are like alumni? Yes, we, yeah, a lot, especially local. Um, a lot of people who, it, the good thing about athletics is you get the people who support you because you're winning. Um, so you draw them in that way, they start coming to games because you're winning. 